Good evening. My name is Bill Doley, the president of Archaeology Southwest, a nonprofit organization based down in Tucson. And I want to welcome you again to the second uh, archaeology cafe that's been held here in, in the Phoenix area. So I see some familiar faces. That Desert Foothills chapter gets here really early, folks. Uh, and <laughs> good to see you back. And uh, I'm glad to see there's also some new uh, folks who just discovered us in the, in the last month. So welcome. So a little bit of background as to what an archaeology cafe is about. It's a, an informal setting. The waiters will continue to bring you food and drink um, over the course of uh, the, even the conversation tonight when Alan uh, starts up. And we are doing a uh, video recording of tonight's uh, session. And this is sponsored by the Arizona Humanities Council. It's a grant from them that's making this possible. So <clears throat> what we'll start out with is um, Alan will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes and we'll open this up to uh, an opportunity for conversation. And there will be this microphone that I hold in my hand is going to be what we're going to ask you to <clears throat> speak into to get your questions recorded. So this is an opportunity for a really informal interaction with someone <clears throat> of Alan Ferg's stature. Um, Alan is a, he's retired already, uh, a young retiree, but he's been an archivist. Uh, he's trained as an archaeologist as well at the Arizona State Museum. And over the course of his career, he has invested incredible amounts of time into looking into a wide diversity of topics. Uh, you will have a hard time getting to a depth of arcana that uh, our Alan has not explored. <laughs> so, and I, I say that in a very positive way. He has got a lot of really uh, incredible information to share with you tonight. And before I turn the stage over to him, let me, if you haven't on your way in, picked up one of the ideas for tonight's uh, session came from the fact that over the course of time, uh, Alan was the lead author on three different issues of the Archaeology Southwest magazine. The first one was Horses in the Southwest back in 2004. Then <coughs> we brought him in to take the lead on Birds in the Southwest, and one that I really had a good time with, uh, dogs in the Southwest. So he'll be, these are available at the uh, check-in table. If you didn't pick them up on the way in, they're uh, free to take away. And <coughs> just a, over the course of time, if you look at these old documents, you notice that it's Archaeology Southwest is the name of the publication, but it was published by the Center for Desert Archaeology. In January of this year, we changed our name to Archaeology Southwest. So it's the same uh, entity, Archaeology Southwest, used to be the Center for Desert Archaeology. Now we put out Archaeology Southwest magazine. This is the latest issue. We've kind of converted, converted to a much more magazine format. So uh, that's another thing that uh, I'd ask you to consider is uh, consider becoming a member of this organization. It's our goal is to uh, pursue what we call preservation archaeology. That's research, it's public outreach, and we actually <coughs> protect archaeological sites through easements or ownership of sites. So we have a dozen sites across the Southwest uh, currently in our portfolio that's protected. So these out outreach events We've been doing these cafes in Tucson for six years now, and we've been itching to bring the, the concept up here to, to Phoenix. Uh, your turnout here is greatly reinforcing and encouraging to us to continue this. So uh, thank you for coming out tonight. And now let me turn you over to Alan Ferg, and we'll give the formal title, Turkeys and Macaws and Dogs, oh my. 
Animals and Humans in the Southwest. Alan? to remember to use this. Um, I'm distressed by the number of professional archaeologists in the audience. Uh, so I'll just say that for some of you, this will be more than you ever wanted to know on the topic. And for some of you, it'll be much less. Uh, I was a little concerned when Bill first approached me about doing this uh, talk uh, because it had no visual aids. Uh, I'm used to working from slides. and. I really didn't know how um, I would be able to convey visually any sort of sense uh, of what the topic would be about. But somehow, uh, I, will, I will work through the evening in the hopes that I can paint visual pictures for you of the topics that we're going to discuss. <laughs> so I think we'll start with dogs. And I'm not giving you an in-depth uh, treatment of any of these topics. There's lots and lots more that uh, there are various lists of books to be found on Archaeology Southwest's website. Uh, I'll show you a few publications that I think are great if any of you want to pursue it further. Uh, but I'll try to give an overview of the, the kinds of interactions that occurred between various animals and humans in the prehistoric Southwest, sometimes into the historic period as well. Uh, and so it'll be sort of a mishmash of anecdotal information. Uh, some of it's true and some of it I'm making up as I go. Um, but let's talk about domestic dogs first. Um, domestication of dogs from wolves probably took place in the old world, and you can find all sorts of arguments about how long ago that occurred, anywhere from 30,000 uh, to a lower number of 10,000 years BC, BP. Um, regardless of which it is, uh, dogs were coming to the New World with humans as North America and South America were being populated. So they're an animal that has been associated with humans for a long, long time. Um, the kinds of dogs, domestic dogs, that have been found in the Southwest have typically been categorized before the era of extensive genetic testing as large Indian domestic dogs, small Indian domestic dogs, and my favorite, short-faced Indian domestic dogs. <laughs> and these are just morphological categorizations of the animals you're seeing running around. Um, Will Barnes, who you may have heard his name associated with a book called Place Names of Arizona, traveled all over. And on the Apache Reservation, he observed once that there were many, many dogs. Short dogs, fat dogs, skinny dogs, dogs with three legs, dogs with one eye, dogs with cut ears, a veritable uh, congregation of dogs. And that's what there is all through prehistory and history. And the kinds of interactions that have gone on between dogs and humans in the Southwest, uh, I'm sure we could rattle off a long list here very easily. They serve as guard animals to alert you when someone's coming into your camp, into your Pueblo. They help while you're hunting. They can serve as draft animals. Out on the plains is more typically what you think of dogs as pulling a travois to haul uh, bedding and goods, but they were used that way in the Southwest as well. Babysitters for your kids. Bed warmers on cold nights, three dog night. Uh, cleanup crew is actually probably one of the most important functions. Uh, if you have a dog, you know that they'll eat virtually anything, no matter how disgusting. Uh, they're very handy to have around your camp, your rancheria, your pueblo to clean up the streets. Um, you can use dog hair 
uh, you can weave it, you can make twine. It's much more difficult to weave than cotton or wool, uh, but it does work. And there are dog hair artifacts from the Southwest, the most famous being some sashes made out of dog hair that were found in the Four Corners area. Uh, and then there's the matter of food. Uh, you can also eat dogs. Um, eating dogs was not a major use of them in the Southwest. It was more common on the plains, but it was very common uh, to the south of us, into Mesoamerica. Uh, the little hairless dogs uh, that you see both live and in the wonderful effigy vessels that come from the West Mexican state of Colima, um, those are reasonably good renderings of fat little hairless dogs, often with bad dentition, little snaggletooth creatures uh, that were pets until it was dinner time. Uh, and then uh, this, this breed of dog, which was called It's Squintly, and I'm sure I mangled that pronunciation, um, was raised specifically for this purpose. Uh, and there are occasions when this survives into historic times in the form of an enchihuahua. I did not see these on the menu tonight. Uh, and I think you can get them in either red or green. So eating dogs is not something that was particularly common in the Southwest. Bones do show up in trash deposits. Some of them have butcher marks, some of them are burned. But by and large, dogs were far more valuable for companionship, protection, uh, these sorts of functions uh, in southwestern life, whether you're in the southern deserts or up on the plateau. Um, however, having just made that statement, I'll say that perhaps an equal or more important role for dogs certainly in Mesoamerica, and by extension and guess and inference in the Southwest, is their role in various ritual purposes. Um, in Mexico, dogs would get sacrificed. Um, in the Southwest, they appear to have gotten sacrificed. There are examples in Pueblo sites. Uh, if you look in the Archaeology Southwest issue, there's an article that talks about the use of dogs, puppies, uh, being placed in what are called closing deposits in kivas at uh, Jamalavi Pueblo in Jamalavi State Park. If any of you have ever been up there, uh, it's right next to Winslow on I-40. Uh, and when kivas were abandoned at this particular site, various ceremonial deposits were put in place to basically ritually say, this is done, this is finished, it's not going to be used anymore. Uh, several sacrificed puppies were part of that ritual deposit. So they're serving these uh, functions in the Southwest that sort of are shadows or reminiscent of more obvious things that we have better records of in Mexico. Um, there are a few effigy pots of dogs in the Southwest, not very many, uh, and they're shown curled into a circle. Um, we don't know much about them, so few have been found that there's not much to say about them from their context as to why they were made, what they were used for. But again, if you look southward into Mexico, especially at Colima-ish uh, animal effigies, you'll find that these things are usually associated with water one way or another, and it's not unreasonable to infer that these strange little dog effigy pots in the Southwest were also used to contain water for ceremonial purposes. I think in, there are a lot of dog burials in the Southwest. Early in time, just one or two here and there. But as you come upwards in time, and for the Salado and for the Hohokam area, 
uh, as you get into the classic period, and I suppose we're talking AD 1100, 1150, 1200, dog burials become more numerous, uh, and they have their own cemeteries, which are located near human cemeteries. Sometimes they're with humans, uh, but they are often buried by themselves, but in a cemetery of their own. This sort of special treatment of dogs gives us a, a fuzzy insight into the fact that they must have somehow been held in some special regard by the prehistoric people that bothered to bury them. They may have been pets, uh, but their inclusion with humans at times suggests, well, it could have been the guy's pet, could have been a sacrifice, but if you were in Mexico, you would say, well, the dog is there to help guide him to the underworld. Um, this is an important function of dogs in Mesoamerica. And again, coming back to Colima, which I guess I will repeatedly, hadn't thought about it, they make many, many varieties of wonderful anime, animal effigies in ceramics. Um, most of these little dog effigies that have been recovered, mostly by pot hunting over the last 150 years, uh, come out of burials. And it may be that they're simply offerings, but it may also be that they're dogs. They are stand-ins for real dogs. And the fact that dogs get their own burials makes you wonder to what extent dogs have some sort of personhood uh, and they are deserving of their own special treatment. Um, we do have dogs buried with people in the Hohokam area. Some of you may have also heard of White Dog Cave in northeastern Arizona. This was an uh, important discovery early in the 1900s. And as you might guess from the name, a mummy of a white dog was recovered. Actually, it's sort of a dirty buff colored, and the name is a misnomer. Uh, he's not just uh, dirty from being buried in the ground. Uh, he was probably a tan color. And there was also a black and white uh, puppy, puppy or smaller dog, in the same burial, which was of an adult woman. So again, you're hard pressed to say, were these her favored pets? Uh, were they sacrifices? Were they her guides to the afterlife? We don't really know for sure. Uh, because stories related to this sort of use haven't really survived or at least haven't been uh, told by historic Pueblo peoples. Um, in southern Arizona, dogs also seem to have had special status um, and they do figure in various stories. And I will, I will look to my right for clarification if I screw up this recounting of a Pima story. <laughs> Um, when the animals could all talk in their early days of existence, they had a council house like everyone out, everyone else, pardon me, uh, to meet when necessary to work out problems. You know, when should it be daylight? When should it be dark? Who should do this? Who is responsible for that? And when you come into the council house, you basically take off what, if you were a dog, would be your pants or your rear end and you hang them on a hook um, and so everyone comes into the council house and sort of sets aside um, their, their rear ends and you meet and when it's time to leave everybody goes and gets theirs off the hook and puts them back on and leaves. Uh, this was a fine system until the time that the council house caught fire and everyone rushed out and there was a lot of confusion and everybody just grabbed the first butt that they could lay their hands on <laughs> and went out the door. Well, as you might guess, there was a lot of mistaken uh, donning of other people's pants. Uh, and that is the reason that today, dogs, when they meet each other, will sniff. <laughs> they're, they're still looking for theirs. And I was going to ask ahead of time, can I say sisiput on air? <laughs> um, so all the dogs are looking for their sisiput. Um, so it's an amusing story to us. It is funny. It's probably funny to the Pimas, too. Uh, but 
the relevance it has for modern day archaeology and interpretation of culture history and all these rather grandiose sounding things is that there are ceramic effigies uh, that look a lot like this. This is a replica that was made during the Pueblo Grande project. Um, these have been found at various sites in the Phoenix Basin. Uh, this is normal size, shape, painting. Um, and initially, uh, Cushing found a cache of these figurines. They're solid, solid clay with paint uh, at a site. Uh, I don't know, is it in Mesa, Phoenix, Tempe, called Los Guanacos. And Los Guanacos is guanacos, like alpacas and llamas, uh, because he looked at these and went, oh, they appear to be guanacos. <laughs> Cushing had a lot of good ideas, but he had <laughs> a few that sort of were really stretching it. Uh, over the years, as more people have looked at these uh, and realized that no guanaco or yama or alpaca bones have been found much north of South America. Um, the question is, what do these little effigies represent? And the, the, there is some debate. Some people think they could be deer, uh, an important game animal. Uh, but the, the consensus of most archaeologists and zooarchaeologists, and I think Native Americans, is that they're dogs. Um, so why do you make effigies of dogs and bury them in caches that have no functional use? Well, their function is that they are probably ritual caches of some sort. We don't know what that ritual may have been. Um, we're not aware, archaeologists are not aware of any um, rituals or songs that have survived into the historic period that deal with dogs. Um, but again, because they've been buried in caches, these effigies themselves have received special treatment, leads you to believe that dogs did have some special role in prehistoric Hohokam culture. Uh, we may or may not ever figure out precisely what that is, uh, but it seems pretty clear. And aside from any academic interest on that point, this bears on questions of repatriation to Native American groups now. You may have heard of something called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. This was a law passed in 1990, 91, 90, I think. 90? 90 is what most of us are saying. And it um, provides for the return of human remains and grave goods and sacred objects to native peoples uh, to, at their discretion, be reburied or taken care of by them. Um, these caches were felt by the four southern tribes, which includes the Gila River Pima, to have been special objects. Don't know what for. Uh, and this provided an interesting sort of real life check uh, at the Arizona State Museum when they asked for some of these back. Under NAGPRA, it has to be human remains or grave goods or a sacred object. And a strict reading of the federal law, these really didn't fit any of those categories. However, the Gila River Pima did provide the State Museum with a list of reasons that they felt these were sacred objects and based on the strength of their arguments and the fact that archaeologists really can't uh, counter those arguments at this time with any reasonable arguments, um, the Arizona State Museum agreed under state law that there was a reasonable basis to consider these as sacred objects and they were in fact returned to the tribe who is taking care of them now. Um, and one last thing can be mentioned, two last things. Uh, we were talking earlier about how would you tell this is a dog? Well, their tails curl forwards over their back. Coyote tails don't do that. Wolf tails don't do that. That's very dog-like. And coming back to the story of the council house and the sisiput, all of these guys have a sisiput.
Last thing I'll say about dogs um, is there's another interesting aspect to them. You know, you can veer off into all sorts of tangents when talking about human and dog interaction. Uh, how many of you know what valley fever is? How many of you have had it? Probably more of you than think, but uh, valley fever is a spore that lives in the ground uh, and lasts a very long time, even under the driest of conditions. And when soil is disturbed and these spores go up into the air along with all the dust and you breathe them in, in the nice moist uh, environment of your lung tissues, they take seat and you basically sort of have what amounts to a very sometimes lethal case of, you know, athlete's foot of your insides. Um, valley fever, you, many of you may have had it and not know it. You thought you had the flu one year. Uh, in fact, I know that that's what a Navy doctor who had probably never heard of valley fever told me at one point. Uh, I had tested negative for it the year before and the year after when I went to go to field school and they tested everyone to see if you'd had it, I tested positive. So I think my flu uh, was valley fever. And mostly it's coughing, it's headaches, but it can be very serious and it can be lethal. Um, dogs share this with us. Dogs can get valley fever. Um, the reason this came up <laughs> at tonight's lecture is that um, uh, an individual by the name of Mike Fink, who works in the Phoenix area, I think he's with the health department actually, um, was curious about what is the time depth of human cases of valley fever. How would you determine this? Well, you'd want to look at prehistoric burials or bone or tissue. Um, but it really doesn't leave any marks on human bone very often. And I say very often because sometimes it does. In dogs, it almost always results in what is called, the, the, in the growth of what is called cauliflower bone. Uh, cauliflower, like the vegetable, because it's very sort of rounded, porous uh, bone growths that have no rhyme or reason to their shape. And dogs will get this in their joints, in their hips, on their skull, and it's painful for them. Uh, it's painful for humans who will most often experience this type of bone growth in joints. Um, and so Fink thought up the interesting idea of looking at prehistoric dog burials to see if he could find any examples of this cauliflower bone growth that would be an indication that valley fever was also something that was a health issue in the past. Um, after thinking I was going to get a great story out of this from him, I finally realized in talking to them that he had thought up this great strategy but never actually carried it out. Um, and to date, I don't know that any examples of cauliflower bone on prehistoric dog burials has actually been found. Nevertheless, it is something to watch for and it's something that archeologists digging up any dog burials into the future should would very much want to watch for. Uh, it's just another, another way to get at uh, the history of diseases for dogs, but also for humans in prehistory. So I think that's it for dogs. I think we should move on. I think we should move on to turkeys. Um, like dogs, Archaeologists, archaeologists seem to do things in threes. You know, there's early, middle, late, you know, <laughs> stone, iron, bronze. Um, so like dogs, there are large Indian domestic turkeys. There are small Indian domestic turkeys. And there are Miriam's wild turkeys. Um, also like dogs in the Southwest, turkeys seem not to have really been used for food that much. They were more useful and more valuable as, like dogs, cleaners up of camp. 
They're also very good at going around, picking up and eating most anything. Um, more often, turkey, turkey bone would get used for bone awls for weaving, uh, bone tubes for finger rings, decoration, jewelry. Turkey feather blankets were an important item uh, in early prehistoric times. And you go, what's a, what's a turkey feather blanket? Um, you pull all the feathers out, split them, and weave them into cordage, into twine, and then use that twine and cordage to weave a blanket. So what's, why go to all this trouble? Uh, well, the same way that birds fluff up to keep warm by getting layers of air between their feathers, uh, turkey feather blankets work the same way, and they're very warm. Uh, so you will find turkey feather blankets as a standard um, item of the household uh, in a lot of basket maker and early Pueblo sites up in the Four Corners area where there's lots of turkeys and there's good preservation in dry caves. Um, we don't know so much about prehistorically, but historically the most important function of turkeys has been to provide feathers for prayer sticks for both Pueblo groups and I think to some extent for Piman groups. Um, turkeys are an important native species that's always been here, sort of, uh, and they are a standard component of the feathers that are used on prayer sticks. Uh, Ed Ladd, a Zuni anthropologist, talked about the sheer numbers of feathers that one family at Zuni would use in any given year, and it ran into the thousands of feathers from dozens of different birds. Turkeys, um, like dogs, are a domesticate. Um, they can go feral, but they thrive under human care. Um, turkeys, I think, were first characterized as being a domesticated animal in the Southwest when early archaeologists started finding these little pens, uh, either wattle and daub or just sticks, but built into cliff dwellings along with kivas and household structures and pit houses and storage cysts, there would be these little bins uh, with roofs uh, that could be blocked off that seemed to have an awful lot of turkey bone in them. Uh, and they also had turkey shell in them. And they also had the bones of baby turkeys in them. And when you put all that together, it's a pretty strong, simple, convincing argument that these people are raising turkeys. Um, so what were they doing with them? Well, mostly blankets, mostly feathers. Not much in the way of evidence for eating turkeys. Um, but the other good thing you can do with turkeys if you're looking to the south into Mesoamerica is you can sacrifice them. Um, there were a few copies, uh, they may be gone now, but if you're interested in the possibilities of the way um, birds of all stripes were used, turkeys, macaws, parrots, eagles, ravens, how usages in Mesoamerica may have been reflected in usages in the southwest, this is a great book. It's called Southwest Birds of Sacrifice by Sharman McCusick. And she has spent her life researching birds and bird bones. And you cannot draw direct parallels between actions in Mesoamerica with the Southwest, but there are some really intriguing similarities. Um, some of the very few turkey mummies that have ever been discovered in the Southwest, again in the Four Corners area, don't have their heads. Maybe a dog ate it off. Uh, hard to say. There were no cut marks on the vertebra, but they still don't have their heads. This is a common problem for turkeys in Mexico, <laughs> where you get sacrificed to Tezcatlipoca to bring rain. Uh, Individual turkey legs also will get cut off and used as offerings and little ceremonial deposits. So between that and the, the contemporary historic use of turkeys as sort of the single required component of the feathers on a prayer stick, turkeys are important 
And some of those ways have to do with religion and rainfall and crop fertility and making a living. Um, and I'll touch on where did turkeys come from, but because there are so many archaeologists in this room, and for some reason they're taping this, I don't, I don't really think I want to overstep my knowledge tonight. Um, initially, everybody was just happy to know that the prehistoric peoples had turkeys and they had domesticated them and that was cool. It was one of the few domesticated animals in the New World. Um, and the presumption was that, you know, turkeys have always been here. And at some point, like dogs from wolves, uh, these uh, animals were brought into the human uh, community and domesticated, and there you go. That's the story of turkey domestication. Well, it always gets more complicated the more you know. That's the sad part of it. Um, in the 1980s, a big volume about turkeys came out uh, of the L.A. County Museum of Natural History, and one of the papers dealt with looking at extinct Pleistocene turkeys and measuring everything you can measure on a turkey skeleton and comparing them with modern turkeys in the Southwest. And the conclusion was, based on measurements and skeletal features, is that Pleistocene turkeys are not directly related to the turkeys that are still here. If that's true, where did the turkeys that are here come from? Um, in the 1990s, a way to approach this question was, uh, again, Sharman McCusick and a fellow named Amadeo Ray looked at all of the prehistoric turkey feathers and skin and mummies that they could find. There's not a lot, but what there is based on the coloration, the plumage, the size, the color of the skin, uh, particularly the color, sorry, the color of uh, the scaled legs, they hypothesized that there were at least two instances of turkey domestication. One probably in the southeastern United States, which came westward and was made available first in New Mexico to southwesterners. And this is what's called the small Indian domestic. Uh, Meliagris Osceola, I think. We'll try that. Um, that's probably in AD 500, 600s when this bird becomes available from outside the Southwest. It's an import. Sometime mm, several hundreds of years later, um, a larger breed of turkey, the large Indian domestic, uh, was probably domesticated in Western Texas, southeastern uh, New Mexico, maybe northern Mexico itself, and that bird also was traded into what we consider the more heartland areas of the southwest, Rio Grande Pueblos, Arizona Pueblos. Um, and what of, what of Miriam's wild turkeys, the turkeys that you would go out and hunt? Well, they actually appear to be feral examples of large Indian domestics. These were turkeys that arrived in the Southwest, domesticated, some escaped, and as with dogs also, went feral. They, they went native. They um, got out in the world and never came back. Um, so the Miriam's wild turkey, which everyone sort of assumed was the ancestor of these prehistoric domesticates, is actually their feral descendant. Um, and that's about as far as my knowledge goes. What I can tell you is that with the availability of inexpensive DNA testing now, uh, a variety of people are working on painting a very much more detailed image of where did these birds come from exactly, how are they related to one another, when did this domestication occur, when did this split into various different breeds occur, uh, and if I read the website of the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society in Tucson, I believe the next issue of Kiva will have two important articles that deal with this. So you and I can read it and find out about it at the same time.
So that's it for turkeys. Now, this is, this is one of those who's buried in Grant's tomb question. <laughs> what restaurant are we in? I, I heard some answers and they were all correct. Makayos. Now I Googled Makayos earlier today and it told me that it was a um, proper name of no specific meaning. However, when I asked an employee here, they were a little uncertain, but uh, I think when I passed up the Google links to things that talked about macaws and Brazil, I missed a boat. Am I seeing confirmation back there? Yeah, what, what's, what's the story of the origin of the name? Okay, um, so my guess is if I was a little more diligent with my Google research uh, that Macayo is going to be Macaw in something in Brazil, whether in Indian language or Portuguese, I don't know. Uh, but we're here and I see some sort of cockatoo type things, but one of these birds is, oh, there's a Macaw hanging in the rafters. Um, now, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, Unlike dogs and turkeys, macaws were not domesticated. When all the excavations at Casas Grandes in Chihuahua were underway uh, by Charlie DePeso and the Ameren Foundation, they found macaw pens, uh, sort of industrial strength turkey pens because macaws are a lot better at chewing their way out of things. Uh, so these are, uh, I think, puddled adobe pens with solid roofs. And the little doorways were a stone ring about this big with a stone plug. Uh, because macaws will chew through most anything they can. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, but they're not domesticated. You can raise them. <laughs> Uh, you know, human, humans can raise them without the help of macaw parents, uh, which is what was going on at Casas Grandes. Live birds would have been captured to the south, brought, or, and or eggs, brought to Casas Grandes, and hatched, raised to adulthood, uh, and traded into the southwest, north into Arizona, north into New Mexico. Uh, the trade in macaws was initially rather light, with not very many examples being found before, say, 800. They never seem to have been a terribly popular item in the Hohokam area, which I find intriguing. I don't know how you figure out why that would be. Um, but they become very popular in the pueblos of Arizona and the Rio Grande pueblos and the Mimbres Pueblos of New Mexico. Um, mm, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of macaws there are. Uh, there are scarlet macaws, which are red. There are scarlet macaws, uh, predominantly red, but other colors as well. Um, <laughs> they are identifiable in things like Kiva murals by the fact that their upper beak is light colored, white, as opposed to the other macaw that occasionally, very rarely, shows up in the southwest, which is military macaws, which are predominantly green and have a dark colored beak. Um, the other sort of parrot type thing that occurs in the southwest are thick-billed parrots, which are nice green parrots. Um, as more and more macaw skeletons were found, uh, there was an individual, an archaeologist by the name of Lyndon Hargrave. He started out at the Museum of Northern Arizona doing tree rings, um, decided he'd had enough of squinting through a microscope at tree rings and moved into squinting through a microscope at bird bones. Uh, and became sort of the world's authority on the identification of bird bones from archaeological sites. 
And one of his students, Sharman McCusick, who I've already mentioned, uh, essentially followed in his footsteps. The, the sort of classic work about macaws in the Southwest was published in some time ago now, 70s, 1970. Mexican macaws, comparative osteology and survey of remains from the Southwest. Well, this is basically a laundry list of how many bones from how many birds have been found where and their age and their culture association. Uh, Hargrave didn't have access to genetic testing uh, the only macaw feathers and skins you find uh, are attached to artifacts in the Southwest. Uh, so he's not finding macaw mummies that he can look at and identify them by um, this bone goes with this pelt color, this feather color. So working on measurements and what are called non-metric features, features that are just presence or absence, your bone either has this feature or it doesn't. Uh, Hargrave looked at all the macaw burials he could find from archaeological excavations and carefully enumerated the features that based on live specimens, well, bones from live specimens, formerly live specimens, uh, he knew were scarlet macaws. And he announced that 99. 8% of the macaws that have been found in the Southwest are scarlet macaws, uh, with the other tiny, tiny fraction being military, and a smattering of thick-billed parrots, which are much smaller and easier to tell apart. Um, this didn't sit so well with some archaeologists who spoke to some ornithologists who said, well, you know, species that are that closely related and of a similar shape and size and differing only in plumage, you're not going to be able to tell them apart based on osteometrics, on skeletal attributes. Um, they should have listened to Hargrave. Um, but this led to DNA testing of some macaw bones. And the researcher doing this uh, was having a hard time because, as he said, curators are rather loath to give up their rare macaw bones for you to grind up and do DNA analysis on. But he convinced a few. And I think he ran six samples. This is now probably ancient history that's reported in the Archaeology Southwest issue. And, you know, it's the oddest thing. Five out of the six were scarlet macaws, just like Hargrave had said they were. Uh, this tells you that ornithologists generally deal with live birds and zooarchaeologists deal with skeletons. And if you're going to trust one of them about a bone identification, you should go with a zooarchaeologist. Um, but the ability to do DNA testing now raises all sorts of other possibilities that you can explore. And just like turkeys, you, you we, they, this researcher can now to the extent that he's able to get curators to give up their macaws, uh, can look at the questions of exactly where in Mexico were these macaws coming from originally. They didn't originate at Casas Grandes. They were brought there from further south. Uh, I, I sort of trashed that archaeologist, but uh, in his defense, he was dubious about this, uh, these identifications because scarlet macaws are a tropical, subtropical species. They're from the nice green forest further south, whereas military macaws can get up to within 100 plus miles of the U.S. border in mountain habitats, you know, the Sierra Madres, as can thick-billed parrots. So it was a legitimate question to ask. You know, did Hargrave really know what he's doing? Can you really tell them apart based on these little bones that we're finding? Well, the answer is yes, you can. But it does beg the question of why scarlet macaws from so much farther south? Why do these dominate the trade in macaws in the southwest? Um, I don't have a good answer for you, uh, but we can talk about Again, Mesoamerican uses and significance of macaws, colors for historic and contemporary Pueblo groups. Red is usually the color for south, 
the warmer climates, uh, possibly, if you want to go out on the limb, you can talk about the original motherland from which people migrated northward. So red macaws would have a special significance in that regard. Green macaws and parrots uh, are the color of blue-green water, turquoise, jade, little corn plants that are sprouting, the things that allow you to make a livelihood. And so turquoise and green birds and water are all interrelated symbolism and iconography in Mexico as they are in the Southwest. Ours may be a little more diluted, uh, I should say diluted, not diluted, uh, <laughs> than Mesoamerica. Uh, but you figure, you know, the, the symbolism may have been watered down over hundreds of years and hundreds of miles of diffusion from the high cultures of Mexico. But if you're in the Southwest, macaws are still very important. Their feathers get used extensively on ceremonial paraphernalia, although uh, rereading what this Zuni uh, anthropologist Ed Ladd said, he indicated that macaw and parrot feathers were not used on prayer sticks. They might be used on kachinas and on pieces of ceremonial paraphernalia, but not pajos, not prayer sticks, because macaws aren't native. They are a foreign bird, and at least at Zuni, this was an important distinction to make with native birds like turkeys, crows, ravens, hummingbirds, that sort of thing. Um, so macaws have a very important role to play in southwestern ceremonialism. Um, if you look at, I, I think it's, I forget if it's excavations at Pueblo Bonito or material culture of Pueblo Bonito, uh, a archeology span report from the 1920s, I think, um, by the archeologist Neil Judd, who was excavating there. He had lots of Zuni workmen helping excavate. And <coughs> before Thanksgiving, he got a request for all the turkey feathers that he might be able to bring them from back home, which he did. And emboldened by their success at getting turkey feathers left over from many, many, many white people's turkeys at Thanksgiving, they asked him, well, I, I think the way he says it in the book is the, the head of the macaw clan came to him and said, our macaw died. So in 1924, Neil Judd brought them a macaw, which lived until 1946. Um, it probably would have lived longer, but if you look at its photo in the report, he's looking a little bedraggled. Um, because what he was doing was grow a feather, pluck a feather. Uh, so, you know, domestication isn't all it's cracked up to be. or 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 captivity either. Um, but the, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is macaws and parrots are special for another reason, something that you don't expect from an animal. Anybody know what that might be? They can talk. They can talk English. They can also speak Zuni. Um, by the time this bird died, after 24 years at Zuni, it apparently had a very large Zuni vocabulary and knew quite a few individuals by their Zuni name on site. That's pretty interesting. And just because I happen to read it, I have to tell you a parallel story. In 1799 and 1800, uh, the famous explorer, Al oh sorry, I should speak into the microphone. The famous explorer Alexander von Humboldt was in South America. He was exploring in the Orinoco River, and he was uh, the Renaissance man of his day as far as being a naturalist went. He collected everything. He recorded everything, if he'd only had a camera. Um, 
But there is a story told uh, that Humboldt acquired a parrot from one of the tribes along the Orinoco River from which he was able to reproduce the vocabulary of their extinct neighbors. Humboldt took the bird back to Paris where it became something of a sensation. Humboldt makes no mention of such a bird in his own writings, but he did include the vocabulary in question in his discussion of native languages in South America. So if they were extinct, it's pretty much got to be a true story. <laughs> Who else would know the language? Maybe their neighbors, uh, but I like to think that's true. So parrots, macaws, um, have a variety of attributes that make them special. But most importantly, probably for our purposes, is they're birds of sacrifice in both the Southwest and in Mexico. Um, there are some great little funny drawings in the archaeological report for the excavation at Casas Grandes. And you know, you want to talk about bird sacrifice? They were serious about it. And they, they had the wealth to do it. Uh, I think there's one deposit that has five macaws buried. And they're pointed in the cardinal directions, east, west, north, south. And these are all scarlet macaws. And in the center, which would be the zenith and the nadir, is one military macaw. You know, that's not Susie's pet. That's, that's something more esoteric and important. Uh, speaking of Susie's pet, macaws are like dogs and turkeys are often found as burials in the Southwest, uh, sometimes alone, sometimes in their own cemeteries, and sometimes with humans. So again, you're left with the question of uh, was this, uh, and they are buried with little kids. So the question is, was this macaw this little kid's favorite pet? And out of grief, when the little kid died, they buried his or her macaw with them. Was it a sacrifice to somehow help the little kid along <coughs> into the afterlife? Uh, just what was it? Well, it depends on your point of view. There was a zooarchaeologist at the Arizona State Museum by the name of Stan Olson. Uh, I think it would be safe to say he was fonder of animals than children. And when he saw a photo of this burial of an infant with a macaw laid on its chest, he said, oh, look, that little kid, they buried him with the macaw. <laughs> it's possible. I don't think Stan was being too serious. Um, you did worry if he looked at your dog and complimented you on what a nice dog you had, because he was very interested in the origins of dog domestication and skeletal variability. No, nobody left their dog with Stan to be house sat. OK, how much time have I got? None. Okay, I, I got this signal. I want to talk real fast about chickens. Sorry, I want to talk about chickens. Um, there's a number of animal species that if you find them, you know you're not in the prehistoric Southwest anymore. That would be cats, Spanish introduction. Um, horses, Spanish introduction. And I'm sorry, I don't believe the people that claim Horses in the Southwest are the direct descendants of extinct Pleistocene horses. You're going to have to show me a lot of horses in between before I buy that. Cows, domestic cows, you're not in prehistory anymore. Ostriches, no, not, not around here, maybe in South Africa. Uh, and there are a number of species which are native to North America, but are not prehistorically in the Southwest because they're neotropical species. They're a little further south where the weather's a little nicer. And these include things like javelinas, black vultures as opposed to turkey vultures, and coatamundis. Um, there are a number of early archaeology reports that say, oh, we found a little clay effigy of a javelina. Well, 
they had a really good imagination. <laughs> um, you will not find javelina, black vulture, coata mundi bones in absolute certain prehistoric contexts. If you find them at all, you really have to think about are your, the deposits you're digging disturbed because up until historic times, they were not in Arizona. They are now. Uh, particularly javelinas, peccaries are rapidly expanding their range northward. You can now find them north of the Mugion Rim. Um, I also wanted to mention cardinals as a fourth neotropical species. They got traded into the southwest, but they didn't live here. In historic times, they started out becoming a uh, winter visitor. Now there's questions about are they actually living here year-round some places. But this is another nice little red bird whose feathers would be really cool on any sort of um, ceremonial object you're making. Uh, the only bones that have been found of them are their beak. And that may be because the beak preserves better or the beak is the only part that's still in the skin when you skin out the bird and trade the skin and chuck out the little bird. Um, so cardinals are an interesting animal to watch for. Chickens, there's been a lot of ink spilled about whether there were chickens in the New World prehistorically. And I will skip through this very fast, but um, a fellow named George Carter, based interestingly not on skeletal material, but on historic records, Spanish accounts, feather and phenotype of uh, chickens, uh, linguistic evidence related to what native tribes called chickens in South America, egg colors, came to the conclusion that chickens probably were in South America before they were introduced by the Spanish. Uh, this put a lot of people on edge. Discussions of trans-Pacific trade are still a big argument whether you're talking about sweet potatoes coming this way, Thor Heyerdahl going that way. Um, but just recently, in 2007, there was an excavation in Chile at a site called El Arenal, where they got 50 chicken bones in what they felt was an indisputable prehistoric context. They radiocarbon dated one bone and got a nice prehistoric date, 1321 to 1407, and even at an expanded uh, range of error, 1304 to 1424. That's still before the Spanish. And they said the clincher was that the DNA of their chicken bones in Chile was um, just like DNA of chickens in Polynesia and Southeast Asia. Well, the story's not over because they only radiocarbon dated one of their 50 chicken bones and other researchers subsequently looked at chicken DNA around the world and said, yeah, their chickens look like Polynesian chickens because Polynesian chickens look like every other chicken in the world genetically. <laughs> uh, so that's become a moot point. Uh, 2007 is now sort of a long time ago. I don't know what the current thinking is on chickens in the New World, uh, but it's still a hot topic. And I'll stop. Thank you, Alan. I'll, I'll now take questions. So dogs, turkeys, and macaws in some amazing degree of detail. Um, but there's a lot more inside that little uh, hat there. And <laughs> so what I'm going to do is bring the uh, microphone around to you if you have a question. Also on your tables, there's a, both a pen and a small pad of paper if you have a question that you're not really comfortable about reading into the mic or uh, saying into the microphone. Um, let me pick up your little piece of paper and I will uh, deliver that question to Alan. So first question. Yes, hello Alan. Uh, my question goes to dogs in prehistory. Are there any findings of harnesses or lashings from travois or packs? Backpacks. Not that I know of for the Southwest. Um, 
possibly for the planes, but I don't know, you know, planes don't have, the planes don't have much in the way of nice rock shelters. So I don't know if you're gonna get preservation of perishable things like the sticks and the harness and so forth. So I guess the short answer is no. Um, and the only ethnographic information I know of, well, I think Taos Pueblo had dog travois, uh, which is a Pueblo group that you say, well, there's continuity with prehistory there. Apaches also used them, but most folks view Apaches as more recent immigrants. Um, but actual, honest to God, physical evidence, I don't know of any. I'm on my way. I, I feel strangely smarter. <laughs> Could you comment on jaguars hmm. and how far north they may have traveled? Ooh, jaguars. Um, if you live in Tucson, you sporadically get the treat of seeing in the newspaper some blurry photo of a big spotted kitty that tripped a tripwire uh, somewhere where they won't tell you to protect the jaguar or the ocelot or the jaguar uh that came through. Um, there, there are, you know, there's the mountain, so-called mountain lion shrines uh, in the Rio Grande Pueblos. Whether those could be jaguars is another question. Uh, I, should, I guess I should back up and say in Mesoamerica, jaguars are very important in religion, uh, show up in all kinds of iconography. In the Southwest, I think the only stuff I know of that could be uh, identified as jaguars is in some of the P4 Kiva mural art from maybe Pottery Mound uh, in the Rio Grande. So they were aware of jaguars. Whether they ever saw one alive is another question. Jaguar range used to extend into southern Arizona and sometimes even up into the White Mountains. There was a male jag male jaguars are the ones that seem to be roaming for some strange reason. Um, and in the 50s, there was a jaguar shot in the White Mountains. So, you know, they, maybe he was lost or he was just scouting new territory but they can physically travel much further north in the state than they do now. But they're reoccurring in the southern mountain ranges of Arizona. Um, it's a big issue related to fencing the border, related to immigration. Are you also cutting jaguar habitat off prematurely? Um, but that's another issue. The, like I say, I, I, would, I would bet you that simply based on the depictions of what is a big spotted cat skin with claws in uh, Kiva murals, that at least pelts um, and claws probably made it up into the Rio Grande Pueblos in prehistory. I don't know of any other evidence for it in the Southwest. Another question? Actually, I have several. What would, um, the, as far as the jaguars, why couldn't people have gone down and seen them? We know people traveled. That's very true. There's nothing, yeah, you're absolutely and right. And the other thing is regarding the macaws, two kind of related questions. Um, first of all, is one type of macaw more prevalent than the other? The scarlets or the um, military? Uh, well, as trade items into the Southwest, Scarlet macaws outnumber military macaws about, you know, a million to one. Okay, um, so that might affect the occurrence in burials then, and perhaps yes. they like the color red. Yes. Okay. That's and, and in fact, it, you could make the argument simply based on the proportions that red was more important than green, because yeah, right. uh, they're going to greater trouble to get a bird that originates further away. Okay, thank you. Changing animals, what about fish? I know on some Mimbris pottery that there's some fish and that in the Hohokam, a lot of the suprinted fish, uh, the what was called the squawfish, that's now the Colorado pike minnow, mm -hmm. razorback sucker, were important dietary items, but they don't seem to show up that much on iconography. 
That's about four, I'll give you about four answers to your question. Um, the, the fish reported in the first report from Snaketown included, I forget if it was squawfish or sucker, collar house, something really big. Um, yeah. Squawfish gets to 100 pounds and uh, six feet in length. Okay. Um, I can't tell you precisely, but I can tell you a re-examination of those bones during the second Snaketown excavation in 64 and 65 found that the identification was probably wrong, but it's still a big fish, regardless of the species. They could have been pulling them out of the Gila, certainly. Um, now, as to whether they were bothering to do so uh, and actually eat them, or whether those fish bones uh, are sort of random discoveries, you know, you find a big dead fish, drag it home, and all the little kids ooh and ah over it, and it gets tossed <laughs> in the trash. Um, there's a great paper by Amadeo Ray, who is not only an ornithologist, but basically an ethnozoologist, talking about the similarities and differences in food taboos between historic Piman groups and what you can infer are taboos in Hohokam faunal assemblages. What are you not finding in Hohokam animal bone assemblages and what can you infer from their absence? And he's, uh, I can get you the reference to that article, I don't know it offhand. Um, there are some interesting similarities that don't appear to be accidental between Pima food taboos and the absence of certain species in Hohokam assemblages. And then the other thing you mentioned was depictions of animals on pottery. Uh, you're right, fish, anything aquatic is very rare on Hohokam pottery. Uh, they really liked birds, they liked water birds, they liked lizards and rattlesnakes, um, but fish not so much. And again, I don't know if that's a question we're ever going to be able to really explain or answer. Um, and I'm not sure I actually answered your question. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Let me do one more. Switching to coyotes, especially when you're t in relationship to your discussion on dogs, because coyotes are ancient as well, and they crossbreed with both domestic dogs and wolves. Um, any separation that you see in, was, was the domestic dog interbred? Did it breed with the coyote? Is there any record of that? Is it because coyote is very prominent in southwestern oral traditions, whereas the dog not so much? Uh, everything you said is true. I don't know of any record of either accidental or intentional crossbreeding by prehistoric peoples, or ethnographic ones for that matter. Uh, that said, of course, dogs get out. Um, so some undoubtedly occurred. Um, I'm not, Linda, could you, could you differentiate a coyote dog hybrid skeletally from either one or the other? It's tough enough to tell coyotes from, it, yeah, it's hard enough to tell coyotes from dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're right, as far as, as roles in um, stories, myths, traditional stories, the, the, mythical, the supernatural figure coyote is certainly far more important than the dog. Uh, somebody here? Yeah, I, in all my readings on Chaco, I have, don't recall coming across anything on dogs over there. Do you know of anything at Chaco? I do not specifically. Um, I know the dog burials uh, as apparently part of closure ceremonies for kivas is fairly common in the, the northern Rio Grande Anasazi ancestral Pueblo area, but I don't, I don't know specifically about Chaco. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'd like to. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, you made some very interesting observations, at least to me. I'm kind of a novice at this. Uh, about the dogs, 
and suggested that the dogs and humans came together for three reasons. Sympathy, substance, sympathy, substance, and defense, which is the reason all mammals come together as a species, but I'm not aware of any other two carnivorous mammals that, could, that have come together for that, under those circumstances. And the second part of the question is, would you attach any significance to the fact that dogs and humans share enormous genetic diversity? Um, uh, the, the, he asked about, uh, do I think there's any significance to the very large range of diversity in the genetic and appearances, phenotypes, of dogs and humans? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Uh, you know, I think part of uh, appearance and genetic makeup is based on your environment. Uh, part of it's related to mutations. I think we've just reached over into the realm of genetics where um, I don't think I know enough to really answer that. Some of it will be based on um, diseases. Uh, there's something called founder effect where if a small population of a certain animal is isolated, then the subsequent population is going to look very homogenous because it comes from a very small originating population. So diversity, I guess, would speak to a lot of contact and exchange of people and genetic material. Um, so I think it speaks to a wide range of contacts for dog and human populations, but I don't know what that would tell you about how they interact. Best I could do. Are there other questions that, or if you have something, that, here we go, another one. I had a question about um, the macaw trade. Was there a noticeable shift in the amount of macaws traded between pre-classical and classical Hohokam civilization? I had a simple answer for you right up until you said Hohokam civilization. Um, for the Hohokam, for whatever reason, they did not care about macaws. Um, you know, of all the macaws tabulated in this book, of the hundreds and hundreds of macaws, I think like two are from Hohokam sites, one from Snake Town and one from the Gatlin site near Gila Bend. Um, Whatever Hohokam religion involved, it didn't appear to involve the use of macaws. Uh, they're just not using them. And you could say, well, it's sampling, and we just haven't found that great big macaw cemetery at a Hohokam site yet. That's possible, but enough Hohokam archaeology has been done in both pre-classic and classic period sites that if macaws were going to be a more important part of Hohokam culture and religion, we'd have gotten some clues by now. Uh, but the first part of your question, is there uh, a change in the quantity and the intensity of macaw trade? Yes, there is, very much so, in northern Arizona and the Rio Grande Pueblos and the Mimbres Pueblos in New Mexico. Uh, and the emphasis on them does change through time. I'm hard pressed to remember the sequence, but actually in the article in Archaeology Southwest, Sharman McCusick talks about this uh, ebb and flow of macaws uh, as evidenced both by the number of macaws found at Casas Grandes during different time periods, that being the presumed clearing house for all of these areas, and the number of macaws by time period for say Wupatki in northern Arizona and Mimbrous sites in southwestern New Mexico and Rio Grande Pueblos. And I think the short answer is that pre, pre 1000 AD, there's a smattering of macaws. After that, with the advent of the Kachina cult, whenever you think that occurred specifically and wherever you think it came from, the use of macaws goes way, way up. And of course, it's still very important today. 
Um, there are various volunteer programs to supply feathers to Pueblo Indians. Um, there's a fellow named Jonathan Raymond who started a feather program that was a consortium of zoos and pet shop owners and private individuals who would collect feathers, especially from hard to get things like macaws and parrots and funnel them to um, Pueblo groups. So uh, whether or not they're used with any intensity on prayer sticks, they're still in great demand uh, for Pueblo ceremonial gear. Um, so I'd say that the, the uh, intensity of macaw use really hasn't abated except as regards the difficulty in modern Pueblos in getting hold of them. I remember being in Flagstaff and there was a trading post um, not far off the main drag and I was fascinated to go in there and they would have whole macaw pelts, dried skins hanging on the wall for sale but the prices were extraordinary. Um, so that was both interesting and sort of sad that it would be very hard for any of the Hopis who might come to Flagstaff to afford that bird. Um, but I digress. Other questions? Just a related one to his question. Do the Holcom have any other kind of feathers that you find with their uh, burials? There's lots of birds, as I mentioned, depicted on pottery. And water, long-legged, long-beaked water birds are very popular. Um, quail, thank you. Um, Roadrunners, road the most distinctive thing about roadrunners is their feet. Uh, well, obviously they run along the ground too, but um, perching birds, birds of prey have three claws in front and one in back. Roadrunners have an X-shaped footprint because they have two claws going forward and two back. Um, roadrunners, and I don't know the reason why, but roadrunners are considered a bird related to warfare. And on some prehistoric and historic stone axes from the Rio Grande, you'll see an X mark on it. And you go, oh, well, that's just a random mark. Maybe, but it is more probably a roadrunner track. Um, There are really cool depictions of birds attacking snakes on Hohokam pottery. Uh, very striking images. And you'll be surprised to learn that there's an article about that in this uh, Birds in the Southwest issue by Henry Wallace, who makes a really interesting argument. This is a case where we won't probably be able to learn the specifics of Hohokam beliefs regarding snakes and birds, but the fact that there is this consistent, repeated association and depiction of birds attacking a rattlesnake, not just any snake, makes you think this is an important symbol to the Hohokam. It's more than just uh, a depiction of some natural event that they saw on the desert one day. Um, it's something more. Uh, it's like seeing two snakes wrapped around a staff if we see that, what do we think of? What was that? A caduceus, a medical staff, a sign of a doctor. You don't think about the snakes or the staff. You go, oh, that's a, that's a medical doctor's car that has that on the door. Uh, in the same way, this, this combined emblem of birds attacking a snake probably means more than just an everyday thing to the Hohokam. What that may be, is hard to say, but Henry makes the interesting observation that in just the grossest of terms worldwide, you can say birds are in the sky, snakes are in the ground. Is this an opposition of earth and sky, of the upper world and the underworld? Don't know, but I like it. And I, I think, you know, there's 
All you can do is keep track of the occurrences of those sorts of images and hope that someday some sort of context that they're found in is going to give you a better clue about what they may have meant to the Hoacom. Um, and what was the original question about birds? <laughs> ah, feathers. You know, um, dry deposits with feathers preserved in them in Hoacom territory are not common. And I'm hard pressed to think of any off the top of my head. What I do remember is that, and somebody from Archaeology Southwest Desert is going to have to help me here, in a cremation recovered, I think, in the Tucson Basin, there were globs of clay apparently fired to hardness by the crematory fire that retained the impressions of feathers. And I think Henry Wallace tried to ascertain what species or family or anything, you know, how, what can I say about what kind of bird this is? And I don't know that he got very far. Uh, but that's like the only absolute, honest to God, hold it in your hand evidence I can talk about. But it does make you think feathers are getting used in cremations, in mortuary ceremonies and uh, depictions of dancers on pottery. They've got feathers. They've got little headdresses. Is there one last question? Alan, thank you very much for sharing your immense knowledge. <laughs> Be